www.morganreport.com. As publisher of the Morgan Report, uh, Mr. Morgan has appeared on CNBC, Fox Business, as well as BNN in Canada. Uh, he has been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, Futures Magazine, The Gold Report, and numerous other publications. So thank you very much for joining me today, Mr. Morgan. Well, thanks for having me, and I appreciate the flattery, but I wish I could live up to it all. <laughs> well, you have been, absolutely, and will continue to do so, I'm sure of it. Um, so let, let's start at the beginning. What do you say? What is your background in stocks and in finance in general, and who were your mentors? Well, my background in uh, stocks and finances, for whatever reason, you know, I kind of knew my passion very early in life, and when I was around... 14 or something, my dad asked me what I wanted to be, and I wanted to be in finance, and he wasn't uh, very uh, positive about that, that statement. But uh, I pressed on, and by the time I was 16, I was nagging him enough where I was uh, got this little form that he sent for called the Uniform Gift of Minors Act, which allows you to trade stocks uh, at an age under 18, which is a legal age to contract. So I was trading <clears throat> not a lot, but some, you know, getting the stock market, evaluating stocks, investments when I was 16. And that pretty much carried through. I ended up uh, at my dad's uh, direction, really moving into the uh, aircraft industry. I started flying when I was 16 and took a career brief one into uh, aerospace. And I was always still, you know, looking at uh, the markets daily, looking particularly at the metals because I was very fascinated about monetary history. So my passion just was all about finance. So when I had the opportunity, I went back to school after my engineering degree and got a, a degree in finance and economics. And at that point, uh, I was out of the aircraft industry and I worked for a couple of brokers. Uh, the whole stockbroker thing didn't really appeal to me. It wasn't anything near what I had imagined it would be. And then I actually went in and for a brief time, and this is not laughable, but perhaps I actually worked for a coin dealer for a very brief time. And I didn't like um, their mode of operation. I'll just leave it at that. So I basically ended up uh, consulting, trading for a living, uh, writing in the arena, and kind of stayed in the background until the Internet started to come to the fore. And I've always kind of been an early adopter. And so I jumped on the Internet. Back in the beginning, you know, with the C prompt and uh, there weren't like chat rooms. There were just these bulletin boards, I think they were called. These, I think they were called BBCs or something. I can't even remember the right designator. But <clears throat> very few people were there. But I was. So that's sort of the background. Uh, you know, degree in finance uh, and self-taught. And by the way, when I went through and got my degree, <clears throat> I was already self-schooled or self-taught in Austrian economics. So when I was given the Keynesian party line all through school, I never was confrontational. I was always kind of taught to, uh, you know, ask questions and get uh, your, you know, I would say adversary, but the other party in a discussion to rethink their premise. And so I was pretty good at that. And of course, in some of the papers I wrote, I certainly took the Austrian school. So I don't want to belabor it, David, but it was very interesting going through school with a whole different, uh, worldview on finance and economics and what's taught. So that made it a little more difficult for me at times, but nonetheless, I persevered. As far as who are my mentors, well, I just mentioned uh, anybody through the Von Mises School, uh, Murray Rothbard, of course, uh, many that have written, uh, you know, through the, through the last several, you know, decades that our Austrian adherents would be uh, uh, mentors. Jerome Smith, who was... Uh, Started, uh, wrote several books on silver investing, wrote many books on the currency situation, and he had uh, actually mentored the Aiden sisters. He had mentored Harry Brown. I'd say both of them, particularly Harry Brown, were also mentors of mine. Okay. Uh, and, of course, books that I would consider mentors in quotation marks. I mean, security analysis, uh, you know, economics in one lesson. I mean, there's a lot of things out there uh, that I have used, but as far as, you know, people I actually got to you know, sit next to, have dinner with, etc. would be uh, would be Harry Brown, uh, uh, Lou Rockwell. Uh, you know, a lot of, of that. So I think that gives you a pretty good idea. That uh, and I'm open minded. I just think I'll add on, David, that I look at the broad spectrum. I don't just look at the Austrian school or look through that lens always. I look at a lot of stuff from the left. <clears throat> Excuse me. I look at a lot of stuff from the left. Believe it or not, and. Uh, to see what they're thinking and, and why, I think the left has, is pretty compassionate for the most part. There's certainly those that are, you know, at, 
labeled left that are, are violent, uh, but there's people on the right that are violent. I mean, I'm not trying to classify, sure. you know, in a general way. I mean, we all have our flaws. Let's face it, we're all human. But I do try to get outside of my box constantly. And as Anne Rand said, and she would be a mentor as well, is that, uh, you know, check your paradigms, you know. And if I'm wrong or I learn something new, I certainly like to incorporate it. And uh, that's certainly been the case in the silver market for me. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, and you know, j just like you're giving credit to your mentors, uh, now I, I find that you're mentoring um, many people um, in, in in regards to uh, commodities, finance in general. And so I, I believe you are uh, passing on that legacy, which I think is fantastic. Um, you're known specifically, uh, or among other things, you're known for your expertise in uh, commodities such as silver. Um, you you mentioned in a popular article. Uh, entitled 2017, a sterling year for silver, with a question mark at the end, that the so-called profits out there are predicting that silver will eventually reach $100 or $1,000 or even $10,000 an ounce. What would be your response to these seemingly bold predictions? Well, David, as you know, uh, my thinking is, is my thinking. What do I mean? I think one of the mo best blessings I've actually ever had in life to, to live my passion was to go through engineering school first. And the reason for that statement is because there's no ambiguity in a lot of engineering work. I mean, if you take a blueprint and you specify what the specifications are for every you know nut, bolt, rivet, what uh, material, what the strength of material is, and there's specifications in all these things. In other words, you know, a type of stainless steel, a type of a bolt. And you took that blueprint to China, Japan, Korea, Canada, Mexico, it doesn't matter. You would get exactly the same product because there's no ambiguity in that blueprint of how to build a, uh, let's call it uh, a door panel right. or something as complex as an airplane for that matter. It'd be several blueprints in that case. So that gives you me a, a certain way to think that eliminates a, not, a lot of emotion and a lot of uh, conjecture that doesn't really apply to fact. So I always try to start with a fact, something that's verifiable, something that's provable. And that has helped my economic thinking greatly. Now, the Austrian school is pretty much fact-based, but you cannot predict human behavior 100% of the time. There's many programs out there that are very good that predict human behavior 90% of the time or 95% of the time. But long-term capital management is the best example in recent times that you cannot predict human behavior 100% of the time because their predictive model, which was so good for so long, failed during the Russian ruble crisis, and it basically took down long-term capital management, almost took down the entire system. So coming back to your question, what do I think about these predictions of 100,000 and 10,000 an ounce silver? The fact is that in, <clears throat> excuse me, the fact is that in a uh, non-backed currency system where there is no anchor to the currency, a hyperinflation is a possibility, and the number uh, when you divide by zero could go to anything in the numerator. So you could have 10,000. I've argued time and time again that that will not be the case in this market, in the current system, because in advanced capital markets where you have a bond market, the bonds are a governing principle or a counterbalance to a hyperinflationary environment, which means that as the distrust of the currency increases, the natural effect is that the interest rates of the bonds will go up and the price of the bonds will go down. So that is highly deflationary. If you took basically, let's just do a thought experiment and do something extreme so we can think at the extremes and ready to come back to something more reasonable. But if you cut the bond price in half for the U.S. bond market across the board from the 30, the 10 year, the two year and the T-bill, you would devastate the amount of credit out there in the system. And that would be highly deflationary, not inflationary. So, again, I doubt you're going to see, uh, you know, ten thousand dollar an ounce silver. You can't rule it out. But what you have to to think about, or at least my argument is strong, that in an advanced capital market, if the bond market blows up, and and I believe unfortunately that it will, and if it does, uh, you know, what are the consequences and where will these prices go? I don't know. I mean, certainly I don't rule out $100 silver. I put that in, you know, my first book. I uh, wouldn't even rule out, you know, two or 300 I mean, I think it's possible. 
Um, but it's not so much the paper price, and that's another thing to really, really think about. What you really want to see is what's the value. What does one ounce of silver buy? Does one ounce of silver buy, uh, you know, a tank of gas? Does one ounce of silver buy uh, a night at a five-star hotel? Does a one ounce of silver buy a hotel? I mean, you know, let's be extreme. Right. And that's what you really want to look at. The number of paper dollars that a piece of silver is worth at any given time has to be quantified in the context of what is the paper paradigm at that point in time. $600 silver is meaningless if a pack of gum is $100, if you follow what I'm saying. So we have to really use our heads about that question. Absolutely. Um, okay, so right now, yeah, you got silver at $17.36 an ounce. So, yeah, $10,000 silver, uh, I'm gathering possible because anything's possible, but uh, don't don't count on it this year, <laughs> 10000 yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I totally see what you're saying, and and uh, you know I'm I'm prepared for anything. One way that I I'm getting prepared is by checking out your website, uh, themorganreport.com. I'm looking at it right now. It says in big letters at the top, uh, "Is there a silver shortage?" And it looks like you've got a free special webinar. Um, you've got all all kinds of cool stuff on here. Uh, what can you tell? And, and I'm going to put a link to that uh, up on the video and in the description. What can you tell people uh, about the Morgan Report and the services that you offer? Well, the first thing I, I've done from the beginning is, you know, done a great deal of work writing videos, webinars for free for the public to basically do an educational series. Uh, Mike Maloney and I are pretty good friends, and Mike has done probably an order of magnitude better than me with his Secrets of Money series that he's put on the internet. I mean, he's got, I think, in the millions of views. But this is something that I do, and I continue to do, and it costs me, but uh, it's worth it in time and money. And one of them is that free list that you're alluding to. So if you just go to the morganreport.com and go to the right-hand side. All we need is a first name and an email. We have to verify the email, and then you're on our free e-letter list. So that's basically just for education purposes. Uh, and we do make offers through that list the time coin dealers books other newsletters um, d different things that some people are interested in some aren't uh, the paid services are basically a premium service where you get a monthly newsletter with updates and and then you get the ability to write us uh, two questions per month that you're guaranteed an answer and then I do videos on my trades or thoughts on the market and those are usually two or three times per month and a lot of, a lot of times depending where the markets are I'll go to the commander traders I'll explain the commitment of, commitment of trader activity. And we look at the stock charts, the bond market, the dollar, gold. You usually don't spend much time in the ags, but you basically get to look over my shoulder while I'm narrating the video. So that's the premium service. The mastermind is one step up from there, and this is where we do interviews with people that are pretty renowned in the industry, like the Eric Sprouts, the John Embrys, um, those type of people and the advantage for being on the mastermind is you actually get to participate on the calls so you can directly interface with one of these people that you met here on an interview like yours but you really don't get to interface with them directly and the other thing is sometimes we see an early uh, opportunity usually in a resource sector that might be something that's too risky for our general readership but people at that level that understand risk and our high net worth can afford to take a shot at it early on and once in a while, there's even a financing opportunity, which, of course, has strict uh, regulatory requirements in the SEC, which we're well aware of and make those facts known. But uh, so it's not a, um, uh, you know, private placement uh, service. Those do become available from time to time, but it's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is for the group, the mastermind group, to interface together and with yours truly and kind of steer the boat as far as who they want to see interviewed, what kind of questions they want to have answered, and, um, you know, what's the most important uh, ideas to be, uh, you know, pursued at any given time. Yeah, I think that's that's great. Uh, so people who, um, you know, they, they'll, they're actually able to uh, connect with you. You're not just sending a product to them and you're not hands off. You're, it sounds like you're very hands on and you, you really interact with people. Um, I think I think it's fantastic um, because they really have an opportunity to uh, tap into your insight and and your you know years and years of knowledge uh, um, in this area. That that's fantastic. So let's get to the million dollar question, shall we? Um, we we've got what many people think is an overvalued or at least a rich rich valuations in the market. 
Um, you know, you got the uh, the S and P's at uh, right now twenty three seventy. Uh, the Dow heading toward twenty one thousand. The Nasdaq uh, heading toward fifty nine hundred thereabouts. Um, where do you think the the markets are headed? Well, I think in a longer term, it's a fairly easy call. I think that the uh, stock market is going lower, and I think the metals are going higher. Uh, as far as the bond market goes, there's actually a pretty strong correlation now and has been for several years that bonds and stocks are correlated. They used to be uh, non-correlated. It was the general idea, as you know, David, that you know if you held bonds and stocks, you actually had uh, you know a pretty good diversification, but that's not true anymore. Having said that, you know, everyone wants to know, well, when? And the answer is, I don't know. I do think, what I do know is uh, stock moder- market patterns. And even though people say all markets are manipulated, and I agree, uh, there, are, there are tracks in the snow, so to speak, as a metaphor, that cannot be erased, that cannot be um, undone. And if you know what you're looking at, you can see them. And one of the patterns is what's called a distribution pattern. And the distribution pattern in the overall general equities market via the SPX, the SPUs, the, the Standard Poor's 500, is there. So the stro- strong hands, smart money, has been offing their stocks onto weak hands for a very long time. So once that's accomplished, and it takes a long time because they have a big position, as you well know, David, and listeners, uh, you can't just dump it all in the market. You drive the price down to nothing. So you just have to distribute it over time, sell a little bit, sell a little bit more, sell a little bit more, and just kind of feed it into the market. It's the same way on the other side. When you want to make a stock go up, you accumulate it over time. If you buy it all at once, you're going to move the stock up rapidly, but you don't want to do that. You want to buy it low, so you accumulate it. So you distribute it over time. That's been accomplished. It's done. Are there big entities and you know banks and all this that uh, own a massive amounts of stock? And the answer is yes, and I'd say most that are holding them are weak hands, believe it or not. So after that's accomplished, then what comes is the markup, which means that they take the market even higher because they want everybody that they distributed their stocks to to think they're really smart, they're really good, the market's only going higher, and everyone's kind of got this euphoric feeling that, boy, am I right. Well, they do that so that they can pick a point at the top, tippity top to short everybody. So they off their stock at a profit, they put it into weak hands, they mark it up, it doesn't take much volume. They get up there at the top, and then they say, okay, now we're going to short the market and take it down. Now, that's going to take place, in my view, and it's a very strong one. I've said this on more than one interview. Now, is that going to happen in, you know, after the 15th of March? I don't know. I mean, David Stockman, who I consider to be a very brilliant thinker and a no-nonsense guy, I'd love to have dinner with him sometime. Uh, he did a great interview with uh, Greg Hunter on USA Watchdog and talked about the debt ceiling and what the uh, – potential uh, repercussions could be, and I wouldn't argue with David Stockman. What I am saying is that, you know, it could be a ho-hum as well. I don't know. Uh, the idea, though, is that I think sometime this year, I don't think we can go through the whole year without some kind of stock market correction. But as far as a big correction is concerned, that may not take place for a while. We do have this kind of Trump euphoria that seems to be gaining momentum. So I'm going to leave it at that. But generally, Uh, Gold is the most negatively correlated asset to the stock market. Silver is 85% correlated with gold, so they're basically in the same uh, bucket. And so you really want a counterbalance to a stock portfolio, which means that all portfolios require physical metals to perform the best at all times, actually. Hmm. Okay, and that actually answered my next question, yeah, Um, which... My next question would have been, you know, should silver and gold be used as a hedge against this, you know, this possibility of a, of a, a deep correction, um, you know, in the coming year or, or possible crash? Um, and it sounds like the answer would be a resounding yes. And it sounds like uh, pretty much everybody um, who invests should have at least some silver and or gold. Would you agree with that? Well, absolutely. And it's not me saying it. Of course, I am saying it. But... Uh, Ibbotson and Associates did a study, and they said basically, depending on the economic conditions, a 15% weighting in physical metal, not mining shares or resource stocks, is appropriate during almost all economic conditions. A study was done at Harvard years ago for portfolio analysis that put uh, metals in the portfolio and had them out of portfolio to determine best performance. It included 
physical metal. And recently, uh, Jeff Christian of CPM Group, and I know Jeff's probably more controversial than I am, but regardless, I think he does pretty good work most of the time. We certainly don't agree on everything, and we do have a bit of the different worldview, but regardless of that, I respect people for not only their intellect, but uh, you know what they produce in the marketplace, and I think he produces a pretty good uh, overview of the, of the facts. And his study showed, I think it was about a 25% rating in the precious metals at the present time would be required to uh, really you know, balance your portfolio or whatever. So these are studies that are performed, on a, again, going back to the, the engineering remarks, on a objective, non-emotional basis. It's just a fact. What do you need in a portfolio to make it perform the best under all economic conditions? The answer is you have to include precious metals. Once again, we are speaking. I am speaking with uh, David Morgan, uh, silver commodities and stocks uh, expert uh, from the MorganReport.com. Definitely rec- <coughs> recommend people check that out. Um, so, we're, 2017 is well underway now, but still, there's plenty of time left. Um, is your investing strategy different in 2017 with this new administration? You know, somewhat. I didn't really announce it to my members because you know they trust me, and as I you know told you earlier, David, I. You know, let them look over my shoulder, and you know I predicted 2016 fairly accurately from the beginning. And I'm a big proponent of you know Richard Russell. That would be another mentor of mine. And you know the idea being that the market knows more than anybody, and price is price regardless of how it gets there, manipulated or not. So you have to go with what's given to you. You have to go with what the market dictates. And I've been uh, in that modality for a very long time now. So. In 2016, I said we're going to get a strong market probably into you know January, February, and that was my you know two month forecast, and it was accurate. But then it kept going and going and going. Well, I change as the market changes, you know, and not. Uh, but the market gives us pretty good clues again back to the tracks in the snow, and so I just held there. And what, so when we got to the top, uh, you know, I had to call it as I see it, and I called it. And so what I did was I pretty made a pretty good trade in 2016. And the reason I did that was because the market was telling me to do that, not because, you know, I wanted the market to do something, it's because the market was telling me. The point I'm making, David, is succinct. I think it's important for some trading to take place. I'm a position trader. I'm not a day trader. I blow everybody up, including myself. But as far as taking a good position uh, and getting it off at the right time, I'm pretty good at doing that. And I think that's 2017 again. I think that, you know, a lot of people thought 2017 would repeat 2016. Well, if that were true, we would still be trending up higher right now, and we're not. Uh, The mining shares have fallen off rather significantly. They were leading. They were coming down while the metals were going up. Many of my membership asked me why. I think I got about four or five, and I did a video for them and explained that, um, you know, most likely we're going to see the metals come down, and that was right before the hit of, I think it was 75 cents on one day in silver. So, you know, they had the opportunity to hedge. And a lot of people that get my service, you know, these are aggressive type of people that are decision makers. They're not, you know, wishy-washy, infotainment only, geez, you know. And uh, and nothing gets interviews like you, yours. I honor you, your time, my time, and I thank you very much for doing this interview. Absolutely. All I'm trying to point out is, you know, when you get something for free, you pretty much get what you pay for. Uh, you know, if you want to know what I'm actually doing, uh, that's another level. And, um, you know, and, and it's not for everybody. I get that. I mean, the general idea is that the bond market is going to fall off, the stock market is going to fall off, metals are going up, and those are good enough issues for most people. And I get that, and I want to do that. Right. But I also know that there's people out there who really want to capitalize on it or have a better, uh, a stronger inclination of what, you know, protecting your capital really means. And, uh, and those are people that would sign up for a membership. So soft sell, perhaps, but that's, you know, I'm pretty passionate about what I do, as you all know. Absolutely. Capital preservation, that's that's my principle number one. And, um, yeah, that, that's fantastic. Um, so I, I'm looking at your website right now, themorganreport.com. There's a fascinating video. Uh, it covers so much, but it, it covers a silver deficit versus silver shortage. I know that's a lot to get into, but sh- uh, should we be, uh, should investors be concerned about a silver shortage right now? No, they should. Uh, there was a shortage, call it a deficit, from uh, 1990 to 2006. We took the uh, bar market, the commercial bar market, 1,000-ounce bar market, from 2 billion ounces down to 500 million. So 1.5 billion ounces were taken off of above-ground inventory, and we're certainly getting in short supply with those numbers. And those are factual. You can back those up with both CPM study and the Silver Institute. 
So you would think, you know, supply and demand, if you had this short supply of silver in 2006, that'd be the high price. But no, from 2006 to present day, we've actually been building inventories, and yet the price peaked five years after silver hit the lowest point on above ground supply. So there's not really a direct correlation in the silver market. This has to do with the paper paradigm, among a lot of other things, but primarily the way that the silver price is achieved uh, in the financial markets. So that's an example that, you know, there's not a direct correlation to supply, demand, and the price. Having said that, you will see that the Silver Institute will tell you that there's a silver deficit. And by their definition, it is true. And their definition is that all silver demand is not met by all mining supply. I said mining supply. So by that definition, they are accurate in saying there is a silver deficit or a silver shortage in any given year. You can take it from, you know, 2016, 15, 14. I forget where it began in the most recent studies. However, if you look at total supply, which includes what's recycled every year, and these numbers vary. If you look at the Silver Institute, and I have them right in my, I got them in my head, but not the exact number, so people can go in the chat room and, and beat me up. But the uh, the uh, general uh, idea is that Silver Institute somewhere around 165 million ounces to 200 million ounces, somewhere in that range of recycled silver annually, and the CPM group. <clears throat> has a, a bigger number usually. So Silver Institute is like 160 and the CPM is like 185 as an example. The point is that if you add in all that silver that's recycled, you have a increase in supply. And what we know are the facts. Let's go back to the facts. Let's get very uh, objective about this. So the low in silver inventory was 2006. Which we're roughly 500 million ounces of commercial bars. And now we're back up to about a billion ounces of commercial bars. And in the meantime, there's been an explosion in the amount of silver investors on a worldwide basis. And the amount of coinage that was held for investment purposes in uh, 1980 or even in 2000, in the year 2000, you know, 17 years ago, was rather minuscule compared to where it is now. So if you add in coinage, which is very slow to come back to the market, if ever, uh, some always does, but I'm talking, you know, pathetically small amounts, you've got about a billion ounces held now in the general populace that own, you know, coins of, you know, one or two or three or a roll or two, that type of thing, to people that own multiple uh, monster boxes of any variety, not just U.S. mintage, but Canadian mintage, Austrian mintage, uh, Australian mintage, you name it, um, Chinese mintage. Actually, I have a box of uh, pandas myself, but regardless. So there's a huge amount of silver distributed in what I'll call relatively small quantities of a billion ounces and in the bar market a billion ounces. You actually have about two billion ounces of, ounces of investable silver above ground now. So inventory from 2006 till now, the last 10 years, has been increasing, not decreasing. And that's how you tell if there is a deficit or a shortage or not. Now, I have to add on, David, because it's critically important because a lot of people have only bought into the silver story or bought into silver because it was in a shortage. And if you use that thinking, you would never buy gold. Gold's inventory has been increasing ever since day one when someone agreed that I'll trade you this little nugget, you know, for that bowl of rice or whatever the first trade happened to be, because gold inventory really doesn't get used up like silver's does. And so the supply of gold continually increases, yet we see the ebb and flow of the price of gold based on basic monetary demand, economic uncertainty, safe haven status, um, productive capacity, like we saw from uh, the early days where the United Kingdom had the most gold and basically had the means of production or the greatest productive capacity on the globe. And then when America became the greatest producer, they owned most of the gold. And now that China is the greatest producer, they own most of the gold. So this is a story that's really actually fairly easy to follow if you simplify it. And gold is important. And yet the increased amount of gold continues to grow year after year after year. Silver, it obviously ebbs and flows, as I just described. But the reason for investing in gold is equally as important to use as an investment metric for silver with the added benefit that there's always new discoveries about silver that demands it used in industrial applications. And because of that fact, uh, you kind of have a dual take on the silver market, meaning industrial demand and monetary demand. Right. 
And, and finally, we've established today that everyone should have some uh, silver or gold or both in their in their portfolio. Um, but what, why not just get an ETF like SLV, GLD? Is it better to actually own the physical? Well, I believe it is. If you go back and Google uh, David Morgan, 10 Rules of Silver Investing, I go through 10 rules that I wrote in the investing rules book so many years ago. And I explain why the physical silver market is more important to start with as a silver or gold investor than it would be to own uh, the SLV or the GLD. I mean, there's people out there that manage money, and they're not going to buy in the physical market. And I get all that. But for the individual investor, even at the a corporate level or a money manager level, I still personally think it's imperative that you have physical metal at some level. doesn't mean that all of your investments have to be in the physical realm. Some people have that belief, and that's fine with me. They can believe that or do that. That's fine. Uh, me, I like to balance it out. I've made far more money using uh, resource stocks than I'll ever make in the silver market. I mean, a quick example, last year, you know, First Majestic was like at a $4.14 loan. It went up to like $19, and we got on that. So, you know, you made like 500% on your money, whereas silver went from what it was, what, just under 14 to 20, so you got a six dollar move. So I can't do the percentage in my head, but what was it, 80 per so 50 percent or something? Uh, it's not nearly 500 percent. You got like 10, you know, uh, 10 times more return on your money invested buying a resource stock of top quality. NYSE AG is the symbol. I mean, come on. Uh, and those are real facts. So does that mean you have to just play you know resource stocks? No, I think you should own the physical metal for a different reason than the reason that you would buy. Uh, a resource equity. They're, they're different animals, they are different investments, and they have a different mindset surrounding them. Right, gotcha. So, th this has been fascinating. Um, I would like to recommend everybody check out themorganreport.com. Uh, I see on your website that you have a contact us page, but I'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like, to let people know how they can contact you to tap into your insights into uh, commodities, stocks, and uh, finance in general. Well, there's a few ways. One, I mean, if you're really serious, I do consultations. They have to be set up ahead of time and paid for in advance. That's one way. Another way, of course, is to become a subscriber. And like everybody in the industry, at least required by laws, you know, you can try before you buy. Of course, we have to get your credit card, know you're legit. But you have like 30 days to just, you know, do everything that's on the protected part, login portion, website only, members only part of the website. And I mean, there's a vast amount of resources there, too much to even talk about. And if it's not for you, it's not for you. And instead of giving you 30 days to try it out, we give you 60 days. So it's really a no-risk thing, and I don't say it often enough because you know every time someone unsubscribes, it it hurts me <laughs> to be a little right. funny. But no, I you know we like any business person. We like every we want everyone to like our product, but we understand that not everyone does. And you know it's just part of the business world, and I get that totally. Believe me, but it's a uh, very it's a Basically, it's a no-risk thing. Yeah, you got to put up your credit card and tell us you're real. But if, again, if it's not for you, and I've had people that um, have written me and explained that you know it was just really not for them because they really didn't like uh, resource stocks; they wanted to be in the physical realm only, or that I've only had one that actually said you kind of talk over my head because I try not to. I always try to. I hate the expression "dumb it down," but I try to talk you know real in real terms that you don't have to have a finance degree to understand what we're writing about. And I write all the editorials. On the stock side, our analysts do that. And that is a bit technical. Uh, it's more of a Wall Street quality. There's what's called sensitivity analysis. Well, what's sensitivity analysis? Sensitivity analysis means that if the silver price goes from um, today's price, we'll round it up to 18 to 36, this stock will go up 20-fold. That's how sensitive that stock is to the price of silver. Whereas the sensitivity analysis on uh, stock B, I'll call it, I just described stock A, if silver goes from 18 to 36, it will only go up fivefold. So it shows you that stock A is much more sensitive to the price of silver going up than stock B. That's the kind of work that we do. And this, of course, is important for people that are serious about their resource stock investments. Absolutely. That, that's, that's fantastic. I, I, I think I actually heard you correctly when you said a 60-day trial period that that's that's fantastic um check out the morgan report.com i'm going to put all of that uh in the description uh mr david morgan um thank you so much you you gave me all i all i was hoping for and more thank you so much for spending some time with with me and my audience today 
Well, David, thank you so much, and uh, stay young, stay strong, and keep getting the word out. We uh, can change things for the better. I think speaking the truth and uh, being smart about our money are two things that uh, is beholden upon us. You know, we don't need to push it off on somebody else. Take responsibility for yourself, your actions, and I think uh, coming back to that kind of Oh, I'll call it entrepreneurial, uh, American foundational idealism is something that uh, is starting to happen more and more, and I think it's important, and I really appreciate meeting people like you that are you know, much younger than I that are carrying the torch and, uh, and these principles. It's certainly not about me. It's about the principles. It's about the ideal. I was always kind of taught to uh, you know, ask questions and get uh, your, you know, I would say adversary, but the other party in a discussion to rethink their premise. And so I was pretty good at that. And of course, in some of the papers I wrote, I certainly took the Austrian school. So I don't want to belabor it, David, but it was very interesting going through school with a whole different uh, worldview on finance and economics and what's taught. So that made it a little more difficult for me at times, but nonetheless, I persevered. As far as who are my mentors, well, I just mentioned uh, anybody through the Von Mises School, uh, Murray Rothbard, of course, uh, many that have written uh, you know, through the, through the last several you know decades, that our Austrian adherents would be uh, uh, mentors. Jerome Smith, who was uh, started, uh, wrote several books on silver investing, wrote many books on the currency situation, and he had actually mentored the Aiden sisters. He had mentored Harry Brown. I'd say both of them, particularly Harry Brown, were also mentors of mine. Okay. Uh, and, of course, books that I would consider mentors in quotation marks. I mean, security analysis, uh, you know, economics in one lesson. I mean, there's a lot of things out there uh, that I have used. But as far as, you know, people I actually got to, you know, sit next to, have dinner with, et cetera, it would be, uh, would be Harry Brown, uh, uh, Lou Rockwell, uh, you know, a lot of, of that. So I think that gives you a pretty good idea that uh, – and I'm open-minded. I just think I'll add on, David, that – I look at the broad spectrum. I don't just look at the Austrian school or look through that lens always. I look at a lot of stuff from the left. <clears throat> Excuse me. I look at a lot of stuff from the left, believe it or not, and uh, to see what they're thinking and, and why. I, I think the left has, is pretty compassionate for the most part. There's certainly those that are, you know, that labeled left that are, are violent, uh, but there's people on the right that are violent. I mean, I'm not trying to classify Sure. You know, in a general way, I mean, we all have our flaws. Let's face it, we're all human. But I do try to get outside of my box constantly. And as Ann Rand said, and she would be a mentor as well, is that, uh, you know, check your paradigms. You know, and if I'm wrong or I learn something new, I certainly like to incorporate it. And uh, that's certainly been the case in the silver market for me. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, j just like you're giving credit to your mentors, uh, now I, I find that you're mentoring um, many people um, in, in, in regards to uh, commodities, finance in general. And so I, I believe you are uh, passing on that legacy, which I think is fantastic. Um, you're known specifically, uh, or among other things, you're known for your expertise in uh, commodities such as silver. Um, you, you mentioned in a popular article uh, entitled 2017, a sterling year for silver, with a question mark at the end, that the so-called profits out there are predicting that silver will eventually reach a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or even and that would be highly deflationary not inflationary so again I doubt you're going to see uh, you know ten thousand dollar an ounce silver you can't rule it out but what you have to, to think about or at least my argument is strong that in an advanced capital market if the bond market blows up, and, and I believe, unfortunately, that it will. And if it does, uh, you know, what are the consequences and where will these prices go? I don't know. I mean, certainly I don't rule out $100 silver. I put that in, you know, my first book. I uh, wouldn't even rule out, you know, two or 300 I mean, I think it's possible. Uh, but it's not so much the paper price, and that's another thing to really, really think about. What you really want to see is what's the value. What does one ounce of silver buy? Does one ounce of silver buy... Uh, you know, a tank of gas. Does one ounce of silver buy uh, a night at a five-star hotel? Does a one ounce of silver buy a hotel? I mean, you know, let's be extreme. Right. And that's what you really want to look at. The number of paper dollars that a piece of silver is worth at any given time has to be quantified in the context of what is the paper paradigm at that point in time. $600 silver is meaningless 
if a pack of gum is $100, if you follow what I'm saying. So we have to really use our heads about that question. Absolutely. Um, okay, so right now, yeah, you got silver at $17.36 an ounce. So, yeah, $10,000 silver. Uh, I'm gathering possible because anything's possible, but uh, don't don't count on it this year, <laughs> 10000 Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, I totally see what you're saying, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm prepared for anything. One way that I, I'm getting prepared is by checking out your website, uh, themorganreport.com. I'm looking at it right now. It says in big letters at the top, uh, is there a silver shortage? And it looks like you've got a free special webinar. Um, you've got all, all kinds of cool stuff on here. Uh, what can you tell, and, and I'm going to put a link to that uh, up on the video and in the description. What can you tell people uh, about the Morgan Report and the services that you offer? Well, the first thing I, I've done from the beginning is, you know, done a great deal of work writing videos, webinars for free for the public to basically do an educational series. Uh, Mike Maloney and I are pretty good friends, and Mike has done probably an order of magnitude better than me with his Secrets of Money series that he's put on the Internet. I mean, he's got, I think, in the millions of views. But this is something that I do and I continue to do, and it costs me, but... Uh, it's worth it in time and money. And one of them is that free list that you're alluding to. So if you just go to the morganreport.com and go to the right-hand side. All we need is a first name and an email. We have to verify the email, and then you're on our free e-letter list. So that's basically just for education purposes. Uh, and we do make offers through that list at the time, coin dealers, books, other newsletters, uh, d different things that some people are interested in, some aren't. Uh, the paid services are... Dot com. As publisher of the Morgan Report, uh, Mr. Morgan has appeared on CNBC, Fox Business, as well as BNN in Canada. Uh, he has been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, Futures Magazine, The Gold Report, and numerous other publications. So thank you very much for joining me today, Mr. Morgan. Well, thank you for having me, and I appreciate the flattery, but I uh, wish I could live up to it all. <laughs> well, you have been, absolutely, and will continue to do so, I'm sure of it. Um, so let, let's start at the beginning. What do you say? What is your background in stocks and in finance in general? And who were your mentors? Well, my background in uh, stocks and finances, for whatever reason, you know, I kind of knew my passion very early in life. And when I was around 14 or something, my dad asked me what I wanted to be. And I wanted to be in finance. And he wasn't uh, very uh, positive about that, that statement. But... Uh, I pressed on, and by the time I was 16, I was nagging him enough where I was uh, got this little form that he sent for called the Uniform Gift of Minors Act, which allows you to trade stocks uh, at an age under 18, which is a legal age to contract. So I was trading <clears throat> not a lot, but some, you know, getting the stock market, evaluating stocks, investments when I was 16, and that pretty much carried through. I ended up... Uh, at my dad's uh, direction, really moving into the uh, aircraft industry. I started flying when I was 16 and took a career brief one into uh, aerospace. And I was always still, you know, looking at uh, the markets daily, looking particularly at the metals because I was very fascinated about monetary history. So my passion just was all about finance. So when I had the opportunity, I went back to school after my engineering degree and got a, a degree in finance and economics. And at that point, uh, I was out of the aircraft industry, and I worked for a couple of brokers. Uh, the whole stock broker thing didn't really appeal to me. It wasn't anything near what I had imagined it would be. And then I actually went in and for a brief time, and this is not laughable, but perhaps, I actually worked for a coin dealer for a very brief time, and I didn't like um, their mode of operation. I'll just leave it at that. So I basically ended up... Uh, consulting, trading for a living, uh, writing in the arena, and kind of stayed in the background until the internet started to come to the fore. And I've always kind of been an early adopter, and so I jumped on the internet. Back in the beginning, you know, with the C prompt, and uh, there weren't like chat rooms, there were just these bulletin boards, I think they were called, these, I think they were called BBCs or something, I can't remember the right designator, but <clears throat> very few people were there, but I was. So that's sort of the background, uh, you know, degree in finance uh, and self-taught. And by the way, when I went through and got my degree, <clears throat> I was already self-schooled or self-taught in Austrian economics. So when I was given the Keynesian party line all through school, I never was confrontation. Basically, a premium service where you get a monthly newsletter with updates 
and and then you get the ability to write us uh, two questions per month that you're guaranteed an answer. And then I do videos on my trades or thoughts on the market, and those are usually two or three times per month. And a lot of a lot of times, depending where the markets are, I'll go to the commitment of traders. I'll explain the committer commitment of trader activity, and we look at the stock charts, the bond market, the dollar, gold. Usually, you don't spend much time in the ags, but to basically get to look over my shoulder while I'm narrating the video. So that's the premium service. The mastermind is one step up from there, and this is where we do interviews with people that are. Pretty renowned in the industry, like the Eric Sprouts, the John Embrys, um, those type of people. And the advantage for being on a mastermind is you actually get to participate on the calls. So you can directly interface with one of these people that you met here on an interview like yours, but you really don't get to interface with them directly. And the other thing is sometimes we see an early uh, opportunity, usually in a resource sector, that might be something that's too risky for our general readership, but People at that level that understand risk and are high net worth can afford to take a shot at it early on. And once in a while, there's even a financing opportunity, which, of course, has strict uh, regulatory requirements in the SEC, which we're well aware of and make those facts known. But uh, So it's not a um, uh, you know private placement uh, service. Those do become available from time to time, but it's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is for the group, the mastermind group, to interface together and with yours truly and kind of steer the boat as far as who they want to see interviewed, what kind of questions they want to have answered, and, um, you know, what's the most important uh, ideas to be, uh, you know, pursued at any given time. Yeah, I think that's that's great. Uh, so people who, um, you know, they, they'll, they're actually able to uh, connect with you. You're not just sending a product to them and you're not hands off. You're, it sounds like you're very hands on and you, you really interact with people. Um, I think I think it's fantastic um, because they really have an opportunity to uh, tap into your insight and and your you know years and years of knowledge uh, um, in this area. That that's fantastic. So let's get to the million dollar question, shall we? Um, we we've got what many people think is an overvalued or at least a rich rich valuations in the market. Um, you know you got the uh, the S and P's at uh, right now twenty three seventy. Uh, the Dow heading toward 21,000, the NASDAQ uh, heading toward 5,900 thereabouts. Um, where do you think the, the markets are headed? Well, I think in a longer term, it's a fairly easy call. I think that the uh, stock market is going lower, and I think the metals are going higher. Uh, as far as the bond market goes, there's actually a pretty strong correlation now and has been for several years that bonds and stocks are correlated. They used to be uh, non-correlated. It was the ten thousand dollars an ounce. What would be your response to these seemingly bold predictions? Well, David, as you know, uh, my thinking is is my thinking. What do I mean? I think one of the mo best blessings I've actually ever had in life to to live my passion was to go through engineering school first. And the reason for that statement is because there's no ambiguity in a lot of engineering work. I mean, if you take a blueprint and you specify what the specifications are for every, you know, nut, bolt, rivet, what uh, material, what the strength of material is, and there's specifications in all these things. In other words, you know, a type of stainless steel, a type of a bolt. And you took that blueprint to China, Japan, Korea, Canada, Mexico, it doesn't matter. You would get exactly the same product because there's no ambiguity in that blueprint of how to build a, oh, uh, let's call it uh, a door panel. Right. Or something as complex as an airplane, for that matter. It would be several blueprints in that case. So that gives you me a, a certain way to think that eliminates a, not, a lot of emotion and a lot of uh, conjecture that doesn't really apply to fact. So I always try to start with a fact, something that's verifiable, something that's provable. And that has helped my economic thinking greatly. Now, the Austrian school is pretty much fact-based, but you cannot predict human behavior 100% of the time. There's many programs out there that are very good that predict human behavior 90% of the time or 95% of the time. But long-term capital management is the best example in recent times that you cannot predict human behavior 100% of the time because their predictive model, which was so good for so long, failed during the Russian ruble crisis, and it basically took down long-term capital management, almost took down the entire system. So coming back to your question, what do I think about these predictions of 100,000 and 10,000 an ounce silver? The fact is that in, <clears throat> excuse me, the fact is that in a 
uh, non-backed currency system where there is no anchor to the currency, a hyperinflation is a possibility, and the number, uh, when you divide by zero, could go to anything in the numerator. So you could have 10,000. I've argued time and time again that that will not be the case in this market, in the current system, because in advanced capital markets, where you have a bond market, the bonds are a governing principle or a counterbalance to a hyperinflationary environment, which means that as the distrust of the currency increases, the natural effect is that the interest rates of the bonds will go up and the price of the bonds will go down. So that is highly deflationary. If you took basically, let's just do a thought experiment, do something extreme so we can think at the extremes and maybe come back to something more reasonable. But if you cut the bond price in half for the U.S. bond market across the board from the 30, the 10 year, the two year and the T-bill, you would devastate the amount of credit out there in the system.